Hey guys, Gassy TV here with another Path of Exile build guide. Today I'm going to talk about the Cold Slinger Occultist in an extremely low budget approach. There's a few things that need to be taken into consideration and in this video I'm going to go through these details and I'm sure my editor will add some of the tests we've been doing with uh, bosses and uh, yeah, have fun watching that. This is a clear speed version of the self-cast Vortex build, which is uh, one of my build guides linked in the descriptions below as well, where it is a very solid boss killing build, but very slow in terms of mapping. It's a build that makes everyone, like you can do so many mistakes because it's so tanky so that you can kill any bosses and without, uh, while still making a ton of mistakes during the fights. This version, however, is a, a very low budget clear speed variant of it, which is called the Cold Slinger. And this style is basically lowering the boss damage output. I did bring this build into test versus A8 Conquerors with 100% increased HP because of two man parties. Um, I also tried it out versus Uber, sorry, Uber Elder, and uh, it was disastrous on this kind of gear. Uh, however, if you increase the budget on the character, they will be no problems to deal with because the biggest problem was lack of damage. Obviously, in this current version, I do have 21 gems. However, I do not have highest level gems or quality on my support gems, lacking a couple of nodes in terms of your damage output, and the gear itself is kind of trash. So if you do put in more budget into it, you can definitely handle these in-game bosses. Uh, that this includes Sirius, of course. Sirius in general should never be a problem, no matter the DPS you have. Uh, so we're going to do another test on that as well, and you'll see some footage here in the background as I'm talking. Uh, basically, the build is designed to be a clear speed variant. Uh, people have been playing it in hardcore, myself included both in the Gauntlet and the Mayhem uh, races recently, which have been absolutely crazy. Uh, and I've done that in Hardcore, and it's been very, very enjoyable. However, the build is not very good at bossing until you put in more currents into it, at which point you might want to consider going low life or CI. So the reason I'm staying in life is because I want to keep the budget down. Uh, so I want to talk about a few things with the build, and we're going to start off with the gear that we're using. The weapon itself, will uh, you want to have plus one level of all cold skill gems. The more areas you can get this modifier on, the better. That means amulet and shield as well as your weapon will be the most preferable points where you can get this modifier. This allows you to increase all the damage output that you're doing across the board. And you also want to have cold damage over time multiplier, spell damage or cold damage uh, or damage over time. All of these modifiers works as well. But the most important ones is cold scale gems levels as well as cold damage multiplier because it's a multiplicative damage modifier. As mentioned, the same goes for the shield. However, we try to keep the body down on this gear. So we went with a chance to block spell damage uh, shield with some life and resistances and no actual damage increase. And like I mentioned, the amulet, it's uh, same thing here. That's just life and resistances and some attributes so there's no actual damage gain from it the helmet the best in slot piece would be a rhyme gaze the problem with rhyme gaze is that that it does prove to bring some issues to you when it comes to mana reservation i'll talk about that in the last sequence of this guide it gives you cold damage over time multiplier increased cold damage but no hp and a little bit of mana but i will be talking about how you're supposed to handle having a rhyme gaze in this setup the rings uh i bench crafted uh attack speed to make the trigger faster don't really need it but other than that, it's just life and rest. And there is mana rolls on this, and I'll explain that in a bit as well. Same thing with the other ring. There is a little bit of cold damage on this ring though, so uh, I managed to make, purchase it for like five chaos. It was pretty chill. The chest piece I'm using is actually non-corrupted. Life and resistances, you can get something similar to this for a, uh, in a corrupted state with the proper colors if you just search the trade for a very low amount of currency, even on early league days or league start days allowing you to get something like this. Uh, other than that, I would have just used the Tabula Rasa. The uh, boots, very straightforward. Movement speed, life resistances, that's it. Uh, the penetration enchant on this barely does anything for this build because we're scaling damage over time effects. The uh, gloves, if you can get with attack speed, that would be beautiful, uh, but cold damage over time is preferable with some life. Uh, I did get some attack speed. Again, it doesn't really do that much of a difference. So life and uh, cold damage over time multiplier, if possible. Other than that, just skip the damage over time multiplier because it can be a little bit more expensive. I think this is the most expensive piece I have on the gear. And then we have Darkness Enthroned. Now the belt is a little bit tricky because you can do quite a lot of the different things. You can use a heavy belt, leather belt, or a stitch in vice, for example. However, if you do use a Darkness Enthroned, you have to put the pressure, because this costs like one or two chaos, you have to put the pressure up on your jewels. In this case, I only have 30 life with some damage over time while holding a shield. The crit multiplier doesn't do anything. And in the other one, I have cold damage spells, which barely does anything, but I do have 11% increased damage over time. And the belt scales this by 75%. So we have 66 HP uh, on the belt, which is multiplied by 1.75. 
giving us 115 life from this belt as well as some damage. This is usually what I do when uh, my resistances is covered from other pieces, then I'm using a Darkness and Throne because I don't need resistances on the belt. It's usually better to get a, a normal rare belt when you want resistances over getting the rest on jewels. Uh, but it's a matter of personal preference. I decided to go with a block rat rather than uh, evasion, so that's why we're using a roomish concoction, where the only modifier that's worth bothering is the chance to block spell damage. And then a battle flask of staunching to uh, get rid of the um, extra damage taken from porcupines when they actually do hit you. I'm going to show you a uh, tier 16 map, just to show you the uh, clearing of this. You are not supposed to do this. I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to right click, left click straight into packs and just tank them which is what you're not supposed to do. And I will die eventually, which you'll see very soon here, most likely. Obviously there's a risk that I actually pull through, but you're not supposed to do this and go into the face of the enemy, because uh, you will die if you do this type of playstyle. So basically, as it goes with everything else in this game, it is to play accordingly, right? So I will die eventually by doing this. And even if I don't die, you'll see that I'm taking an unnecessary, unnecessary amount of damage uh, which can very easily be avoided by not right-clicking, left-clicking straight into the packs like this. Uh, here's the death. And now I'll show you how to actually play the build. A lot of people play builds incorrectly and die a lot because of that. So now that we're playing it in a better way, which is basically sidestepping rather than rushing into the enemies, basically you want to treat them like the serious fight where you're arcing around enemies. You see a pack, you don't want to go straight to it. You basically want to straight strafe around on the sides this way you avoid a ton of damage projectiles and you get full damage output and you don't have to worry as much. Which does mean that you have to be a little bit careful with the way you're using your mobility skills, at least for the higher tier maps. In lower tier maps this is not a problem, even on super low budget. But when you're playing a low budget you're not, even, you're not really tanky. Uh, so instead you solve that by playing accordingly. And as you can see I'm barely taking any damage. Obviously I mean, it's, a hard, it's a high tier map so you can still actually die. But in general, it's all about sidestepping, and um, that makes the build so much smoother to play. And you don't have to worry about losing your experience that often um, if you're having an extremely low budget. Now we are level 87. Just figure we're just gonna mention that as well. This sidestep, and as you can see, I'm barely taking any damage. Same thing here. Boss is spawn. Get the frost bomb out. Get that minus cold rest. And then we also sidestep and step away from the boss here because our vortex is going to land on the frost bolt anyways. Get a new frost bomb out and it's off cooldown. Just keep it up because our damage is damage over time. Our on hit components are barely doing anything. So you don't really have to worry about it. And that's how you clear a map with this build. Very straightforward. So, skill gems, as you can see, I'm actually lacking some of them because I haven't bothered setting everything up since we're playing this on a very, very low budget. The most important ones are the spell slinger support gems. So first off, we're using a spell slinger with a cold snap. The reason we're using cold snap is because this build is clear, clear oriented or focused on clear speed. The cold snap is a little bit of damage, but not really the main focus. This is extra damage for us, but most importantly, it gives us frenzy charge when an enemy dies within the skills area. So it doesn't have to die to the cold snap damage. As long as an enemy dies within this area, you get frenzy charges, and that's how we get the extra speed and damage and movement speed and attack speed from the frenzy charges. We don't have to use a frenzy uh, attack for it. That's why we're using. That's one of the reasons we're using power siphon. The uh, other support gems we're using for spell slinger is a creeping frost. This is one of our main damage sources or secondary main damage source. It's the main spell slinger damage, at least. Where which we're using bone chill and GMP. That's why you can see that we're shooting out these. Uh, more whitish, and not the balls, but the whitish ones. These provides these pools, which are doing a lot of damage, but most importantly, they provide the chilling effect that also has bone chill, which means that enemies take increased cold damage, since this is a debuff modifier on enemies that is a multiplicative damage modifier, scaling the rest of our damage significantly, thanks to bone chill. This is also one of the reasons why Skitterbots are really good to link with Bone Chill for cold damage oriented minion builds. This is linked in the Rhyme Gaze because this is our spell slinging the main source of damage. However, when you use a Rhyme Gaze, we're going to have to talk about this uh, last part in this guide. Well, how you're going to preserve the mana with everything in the Rhyme Gaze. So that's how we use the Creeping Frost. The um, other support gems, or gems we're using is a Flame Dash, Frost Bomb, and Smoke Mine uh, that I'm using right now. The PUB has everything lined up in a more perfect uh, scenario with uh, all the sockets being actually utilized. So what you're watching is a Smoke Mine, Frost Bomb, and Flame Dash. And we also have a Spell Slinger with a Frost Bolt. As you can see here, there are three balls. This is used through the Frozen Trail, which I'll show you in the skill tree in a bit. 
The reason we're using Frostbolt is so that we can pop our vortexes. They are actually exploding on the Frostbolts rather than beneath beneath me. So if I just left click now, it, the frost uh, the vortexes will just land where I'm standing. Uh, whereas with the Frostbolt, it will actually pop where the Frostbolt is. This helps a lot with clearing. The other uh, approach we're using is Power Siphon. Uh, we're using this with Temporal Chains, Hex Touch, and Frostbite. Now, the reason we are using this is because we are an Occultist and we have double curses through Malediction. This allows us to, as you can see, have a lot of extra projectiles as we're shooting our um, Power Siphon. Now, Power Siphon gives us power charges. It also gives us a free culling strike. And since we're getting Frenzy charges through the use of Cold Snap, but there's no reason for us to use Frenzy, which would, because of our cursing, would force us to use something like Chain Fork or GMP or something like that, which we instead is replaced with Hex Touch and two curses. So that's why we're using Power Siphon, because it helps us keep up with Elemental Overload. Uh, which requires us to crit to get 40% more elemental damage if we crit in the last four seconds. So Power Siphon is doing all of that for us. Extra projectiles, culling strike and power uh, charges to keep up elemental overload and Cold Snap is sorting the Frenzy charges, allowing us to not use a Frenzy and instead use Power Siphon. And it looks better. Last and most important uh, set for this build is the Vortex. Now Vortex is not going to be in our Spell Slinger approach. This is a self-cast which I put on left click, so wherever I move, it will cast the Vortex. This is a Vortex linked with Efficacy, Control Destructions, Hyperthermia, Elemental Focus, and Swift Affliction, because we don't need to apply Elemental Ailments with the uh, Vortex itself, because all the other abilities are applying the Chill, and the most important skill to apply Chill with is the Creeping Frost because of Bone Chill, so never link this with Elemental Focus. And basically, as you saw in the playstyle, we're shooting the projectiles, and then we're stepping, or sidestepping, and as you can see, the um, the vortexes will land on the uh, frost bolt instead, covering a large area of damage over time effects. So, as soon as you know, it's what you want to start with is Void Beacon into Frigid Wake. The reason for this is because we want to get some extra damage as soon as we can as we're leveling. And you can level with this build all the way up to um, from the start where you get the level of using Spellslingers. However, till you get Spellslingers, which I think is level 28, uh, you simply use self-cast Creeping Frost with Volley and then uh, just link that up and cast a Frost Bomb and just spam Vol uh, the Creeping Frost till you're level 28. And at level 28, you can then switch over to Spellslinging where the priority is to have Creeping Frost with uh, with uh, more projectiles, either uh, Volley and then later GMP at level 38. When you, when you get enough mana reservation on the tree, you can squeeze in a Frost Bolt to you start using Vortex as well. Be a little bit cautious with the mana. You might want to use a Mana Flask when you're leveling. The second note is the Frigid Wake. Now, this one gives you immunity to Chill and Frozen. I mean, you can't be Frozen, you can't be Chilled, which is really smooth. Gives you a lot of damage over time multiplier and also gives you mini stuns on enemy bosses. This includes enemy endgame bosses. And they chill the enemies uh, that are nearby you also do reduce damage. And the third one in Merc Lab is the Profane Bloom. This allows us to explode enemies that are cursed. And since we are cursing, but we don't really curse everything, it's not really that important, but it does help a little bit with porcupines, for example, and bone husks to avoid dying to that. And last but not least, we're going for Malediction, which gives us the possibility to curse hexproof enemies and apply an additional curse we can use at TC. I would recommend starting with Frostbite Curse so that we are able to do more damage, but add the Temporal Chains after Uber Lab for the endgame maps because it helps a lot. Tree-wise, uh, as I mentioned before, we are using a Frozen Trail, which you get from leveling through the Axe, which is one of the reasons why this build is so smooth for Solo Self Found. It allows us to shoot more protectors from the Frostbolt, which is utilized to spread out the Vortex much easier across the board. The way you level the build is by rushing up here and then into Elemental Overload. Pick up life as you see fit and you can pick up Frostwalker early on. And the um, Conquest efficiency you get from one of the side quests as well, which is very crucial to sustain the mana of reserving all your stuff as well. And uh, basically you just want to go for our life as you see fit and move down to the left hand side. So what I usually start with is that I pick up Frostwalker and I pick up the Heart and Soul. And then I move on the left side for quick recovery. Uh, Discipline Training, Light Divinity, Holy Dominion into Devotion. And I skip the block till I'm level 65, 70, because that's when I want to get a Roomish Concoction and start using the actual block mechanics to be a defensive layer. Once I've reached this point, I'm literally rushing uh, after Elemental Overload and Devotion. I'm rushing the mana reservation nodes because we're going to go for the reservations for the sake of spell slinging. So I start with Sovereignty and then I rush all my way over here to pick up the, these nodes. Uh, when leveling, I have a tendency of actually going into this node here to get there earlier 
and then pick up the through preparation for more resistances and then move into these nodes and then respect this one when I can. And at this point here, when you have these nodes, it's a matter of personal preference. If you feel that you have gear that gives you enough EHP, then you can take these damage nodes, Arcane Swiftness, as well as Freedom Your Finger of Frost. If you feel that you're dying or that you have low amount of HP or defense, then I would recommend going down here to Cold Hearted through Lethal Assault and Resourcefulness through Entropy into Coordination and pick up Blood Cypher because this gives you some Persistence Nodes as well as some Life Nodes and picking up Blood Drinker. So it's a matter of personal taste. And you can also pick up Mist the No Witnesses. This helps a lot with clearing. Some people would say that it's a bit preferable to start with this one. I'm not too keen on it personally, but uh, it's there for the taking. So you can try that out as well because pretty early on you're able to get Mist uh, the No weak Weakness so you can get the Elusive uh, Node as well for that extra defensive layer. So that's basically the skill tree. Uh, so as you can see in the skill tree, I have some mana node specs. Now these are not necessarily needed. It kind of depends on your gear. So the reservations that we're looking at with Rhyme Gaze can be somewhat troublesome in some cases. And this is because we're reserving a Spell Slinger with Frost, oh, sorry, Cold Snap, and we're also using Spell Slinger with Frostbolt. Now these two nodes, uh, they are reserving 20% mana each because they're not supported by anything else. That's 40% of our mana reserved. With Conqueror's Efficiency, and uh, the, um, the reservation node spec, then our Creeping Frost Spellslinger in a Rhyme Gaze reserves 56% mana. Now, this is troublesome because we are going to only have 4% mana left over. Now with 4% mana, it's very crucial that you look at your mana pool and how much your Vortex is gonna cost you. Now, this is not a problem if you're only having a five link, but if you have a six link like I have, the mana cost is 67 at this point, which is the highest I think you'll ever reach with it. So I have to make sure that I always have 67 or more mana uh, pool available. That's why I valued getting some extra mana rolls on my jewelries, and I eventually actually decided to spec into this. And if I take these two nodes away, I can't actually cast my Vortex. With higher levels, this is not going to be a problem because the levels itself will actually take care of this issue for you. So what you want to do is, if you're using a Rhyme Gaze, if you're not using a Rhyme Gaze, this is never a problem. But if you're using a Rhyme Gaze, make sure that you keep track of how much mana you have so that you cast your Vortexes. And it's enough that you have just enough mana to cast the Vortex and that will work fine. So with this in mind, you can spec the Deep Thoughts nodes. These should be enough. If they're not enough, you might want to rethink your gear. Uh, if it's a really panicky mode and you're low level, for example, just remove one of the support gems. I would recommend removing the uh, GMP from the Creeping Frost, but it shouldn't be a problem to do this. Just focus on your mana to make sure you have enough to cast the Vortex. That's the only tricky part, and that's only tricky because of Rhyme Gaze. I think that's it. The other skill gems I haven't talked about uh, is in the PUB. Um, the Frost Bomb can be in a spell cascade and faster casting. This allows the Frost Bomb to cover a wider area, allowing you to get that minus cold rest more reliably on boss targets, especially mo mobile bosses, uh, and also harder packs instead of only having one and it's also faster casted. The uh, Frostbolt and uh, Cold Snap can uh, definitely look like yeah, look like this if you want to. I'd, I'd rather split them up personally. The approach that I've been doing has been pretty chill. So when it comes to utility, I have Second Wind. So it's a bit of a matter of personal preference of how you want to do it, uh, but I'll have the PUB linked in the descriptions below. I'm gonna fine tune it before we post it. So it's perfectly properly sorted. The last thing I haven't mentioned has been the anointment and we are going to anoint Breath of Rhyme. That's two silver oils and a teal oil gives us uh, gives us cold damage over time, increased cold damage, and chance of freeze, and increased effect of cold elements, which will scale the creeping frost bone chill for more damage output. And that's about it. I think I covered everything. The build is very chill, no pun intended. If you guys have any questions about the build, hit me up in the descriptions below. I will make a forum guide on this build, uh, which you can find on the IC Veins website, pwe.vault.com. And um, yeah. That's the last uh, video I'll be having time for before the end of this year. So I hope you guys have a great New Year's and Happy New Year. And thank God this uh, year is over and I'll be back next year with more Path of Exile content. There's going to be a lot of craft guides, a lot of build guides and a lot more content coming up with 3.13. And uh, yeah, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe for more content. And until uh, next time, stay safe. Keep rocking.